evenings. So it's Monday morning, and we have to feed 5,000 finicky girls food they don't like, convince them to fall in love with a boy not of their choosing, and then spend the rest of their lives in a tiny little apartment raising their families with a pesky, uninteresting husband. Thankfully, these girls are not humans. They're mosquitoes. Um, and my name is Fitz McGraw, and I study mosquitoes. Particularly, I study mosquito spit. Now, the reason we put these mosquitoes in this cruel life is all in the name of science, and in particular, um, in terms of trying to understand the study of disease transmission. So mosquitoes are responsible for some of the deadliest diseases around the world, in particular um, malaria that we all know about, but also dengue fever. And my lab studies dengue virus, the virus that causes dengue fever. Upwards of 380 million people per year are at risk of dengue fever, and as you can see, it occurs primarily in the developing world. When people get sick, they have intense fevers that last for several weeks, and sometimes they can die. There's no treatment, there's no vaccine, and so we're interested in finding ways to understand how this disease is transmitted. Now, back to our sad, hopeless girls in their apartments. Why do we do this to them? And it's because the mosquitoes play a really key role in that disease cycle in the field, from an infected human into the mosquito and back to another human. Now, what you see here is an image of inside a mosquito's body, and we can track the process of the virus. So when a mosquito bites an infected human and consumes blood, that blood first has to infect the guts. And after it's in the guts, it has to move out through a whole range of tissues and find its way to the salivary glands. Once it gets there, it can be spat into the saliva. And up until that point, the mosquito is not capable of transmitting disease to another human. Now, we have a number of questions. And the first is, how long does it take for virus to get from the gut to the spit? This is really key, because if it gets there quickly, that mosquito will have many more opportunities over its lifetime to infect humans. We also wanted to understand, do mosquitoes continuously secrete virus into their saliva? And then lastly, probably the one that is closest to my heart is, how important are mosquito genes in this process? And what mosquito physiologies are involved with the migration of virus through the body? Now, we have a number of predictions for our questions. The first is that we think it'll take about 10 days for the virus to arrive. And this comes from previous studies. We also think that the mosquito will continue to secrete virus throughout her lifetime, and that mosquito genes will play a small but significant role in terms of dictating the nature of this process, but that other things like the virus genome or en environmental temperatures or other variables might be important. Now, in order to answer these questions, what we need to be able to do is get mosquito spit from a single mosquito multiple times over her lifetime. Now, this is challenging because mosquito saliva comes in very small quantities, 0.1 of a nanoliter each time they spit. That's one ten-thousandth of a liter. And inside that spit, we need to be able to detect viruses. Okay? Viruses are only 50 nanometers in size, and there might only 10, 20, 30 viruses every time a mosquito spits. So this is a bit of a challenge. And the way people have studied this in the past has been by this really destructive approach. You can see here where a mosquito has been taken, her mouth parts have been jammed into a capillary tube, and her wings and legs ripped off to stress her so that she actually spits on command. Now, our question is about asking the same female over and over again in her lifetime, do you have virus in your saliva? And so if we kill her, this whole process is not going to work. So my lab wanted to come up with a way to get virus from a female saliva over her lifetime. And the people who took on this challenge are shown here. Henry Ye, a postdoc in the group, and Alison Carrasco, a research assistant. Now, these two thought they could handle this challenge, and they first spent six months working in the laboratory every week, trialing different approaches, different ways to try and solve this problem experimentally. Most of their approaches were based on the notion that the way we keep mosquitoes alive in the laboratory is by giving them sugar water to feed. Every time mosquitoes drink in and out of that sugar water, they're spitting. So they were basically looking for sort of dinghy virus backwash. It took many months and lots of problem solving. They tried different approaches. They tried feeding mosquitoes uh, honey co coated paper or sugar water in, um, in cotton wool. But what we found was that these often led to problems with contamination and it was impossible to get the virus back out of those substrates. In the end, they converged on this really beautiful design, and it had to do with really the give and take of ideas and both of their contributions. It's quite simple, really. 
We put a mosquito who's been blood fed with dengue virus inside one of these little cups. These are the little apartments. We give them the lid of a tube and we put into that their drinking liquid with the sugar. Every two days, mosquitoes go in there and feed. And then we can take away that cup and then replace it with a fresh one. So the mosquito is unharmed and we've got the material to then take into the molecular laboratory, extract and look for the presence of virus. Now, once we did this, we weren't done with our, um, with our challenge. And that's, we had to find a way to scale up these little assays for hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes because we needed a big, strong data set. And then more importantly, because we we're interested in mosquito genes, we needed a way to connect this measure of how a virus moves through the body to a single mosquito's genome. And we had to do this within the framework of a family design. So all of our mosquitoes in our experiments couldn't just come from one big population. We needed to know how they were related to each other. So we spent three generations of breeding, grandmothers, daughters, granddaughters, with each generation of egg to adult to egg, taking about a month. So three months just to get all the mosquitoes ready for the feeding experiment. In parallel, we had to have virus grown and prepared. And the way that we do that in the lab is that we grow mosquito cells in liquid culture and infect it with virus. So we had to grow up huge quantities of virus. On the day of the experiment, we needed to be able to take the virus, give it to the mosquitoes in a blood meal, hope that they feed, because they often just don't. And then the next month would be the hard labor. That would be tracking the mosquitoes and taking care of them and looking after them and collecting them sal their saliva day in, day out until they all died. Now, on the day of the actual experiments, Allison came into the laboratory shown here, and that's what our mosquito cell culture looks like. She went to get virus out. And when she looked at the cells, what she saw was that they were contaminated with bacteria. And so to her horror, um, that one component of the experiment had failed in a way that we didn't predict it would fail. Henry and Alice had had all sorts of contingency plans for the mosquitoes because they're usually the tricky ones. And instead, we had this contamination event that we hadn't experienced before. So all those grandmothers, daughters, granddaughters had all died for nothing. And these, these staff in the lab had spent eight months of their lives preparing for this one day and it all came crashing down. The disappointment in the lab was really palpable. People were really quiet um, and supportive of each other. Um, there was a lot of crying and beer drinking and um, cursing the career that they had chosen. You know? um, but people went away from the lab and they took a break and they spent time with friends and family and tried not to think about mosquitoes for a few weeks. And then Henry and Allison came back and said, you know what, we are the only people in the world who can do this experiment. And we spent a year getting ready and we can do it. And that contamination thing, that's nothing. We'll be ready for it next time. And so they reran the experiments. This time, they did it with a lot of help, and they had much better logistical planning. They'd learned from that first failed run. They did all their mosquito breeding in half the time. They brought hands in from the lab to help label apartments and tubes. And so the whole thing went really well. The mosquitoes fed on the day. The virus was fine. And then the real work began. And that was sitting in a small room where we do our dinghy work, because it's safer there, in small teams, two, three people, day in and day out doing really monotonous work, moving around spit, all right? And you have to be careful, because if you make a mistake, those mosquitoes could bite you or your partner and kill one of you. So really boring work, but really dangerous. Henry kept everyone motivated by playing what he thought was the theme song for this experiment, and that was Daft Punk's Get Lucky. And he played it a lot, and nobody minded. And so as the weeks progressed, there was this sort of quiet, growing optimism that they might have pulled it off. And after four weeks of growing mosquitoes, Henry and Allison had 2,000 saliva samples jammed in the freezer. They began going through them and testing them for dengue, and then the entire team sort of staggered off to the physio to get treatment for repetitive strain injuries. But out of it, we got some great data and some really exciting findings. The first thing was that virus turned up in mosquito saliva only four days after the mosquitoes had uh, taken their blood meal. This is unheard of, but it really helped to explain how, when this virus had caused a massive outbreak in Queensland, that it had moved so quickly through the human population, because that intervening time in the mosquito was tiny. The other thing we found out was that mosquitoes stopped spitting virus after about 10 days of age. So what that tells us is that only middle-aged mosquitoes are responsible for disease transmission. And it changes how we think about who the culprits are out in the field. 
And lastly, we found that the mosquito genome was contributing a whopping 40% to the ability to transmit virus and setting us up on a path of being able to identify those genes in the future. Now, this work has been presented at conferences and we've published a few papers. We've been really exciting about how we can better inform disease transmission and have accurate measures of these very important things happening in the mosquito and help us understand disease epidemiology. It's also a technique that we can take on to further our understanding of the genetic contribution of mosquitoes to this process, as well as other people working with other disease vectors, including malaria. Now, soon after we finished the experiments, another postdoc in the lab got married. And during the reception, Daft Punk Get Lucky came on. And the whole lab got up and danced with Henry and Allison. And it was this really emotional outpouring of um, support and respect for these two, because everyone understood what they had pulled off and what the last year had been like for them. I'm surprised every day how when I come to the lab, my job is like uh, watching my favorite genre of movie, which is the caper film. Think the Italian job or Ocean's Eleven. And you know, it's, I love watching just a, a group of really talented people with diverse skills come together and pull off the ultimate job. And that's what exactly is what happened here. And also knowing that the information that we glean from these experiments are going to help us understand how human disease transmission is taking place in the field. All of that is what gets me out of bed every day. Thanks very much.